title of my talk tonight is The Center Does Hold the Franciscan Intellectual Tradition, Context, Continuities, and Provocations. Now these provocations often will be en passant and implied. I don't want to uh, have too many people coming after me after the talk. So just with that caveat, the provocations are very gentle. <clears throat> I'll begin with an introduction. With apologies to William Butler Yeats, the, cent the center must hold because the center is Jesus Christ. In the formulation of St. Bonaventure, the seraphic doctor, quote, Christ is our metaphysics, holding the center in all things, close quote. Christ is the divine middle person of the Trinity, mediator between God and man in virtue of the hypostatic union, and in his humanity, mediator between matter and spirit. This pivotal insight uniquely frames Franciscan thought and spirituality. No other Latin theological tradition so consistently works out a total vision in this light. Coeval with the absolute centrality of Christ for Franciscans is the primacy of charity in God, reducing to the plenitude of goodness of the Father and realized in the economy of salvation, in the absolute primacy of Jesus Christ in and through a Marian mode, the divine maternity. This is the so-called Franciscan thesis. I've been invited to speak to you all tonight about the Franciscan intellectual tradition, which turns about these three core principles I just mentioned. Most people are aware of the history of Franciscan charitable works, and many have a vague notion of Francis Franciscan spirituality. I'm here to tell you tonight that there is a vibrant intellectual tradition unique to Franciscans that has a glorious history that interpenetrates its theological works as well as its works of charity. For example, most are aware that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception for many centuries was the so-called opinio minorum, that is the opinion of the minors or the friars, suspected of being heretical. However, many might not be aware of the fact that Scotus's insight into the theological justification of Mary's Immaculate Conception was rooted in a metaphysical theological vision that was first inspired by St. Francis himself. So it wasn't an instance of Dun Scotus happening to get lucky on a disputed point. Rather, Scotus himself was praying and writing from within a tradition that both preceded him and flourished after him while being greatly and even constitutively, constitutively benefited from his holy genius. In tonight's lecture, after making a comparison between the nature of Thomism as a school and Franciscanism, I will address two main areas. First, I will look at the history of the Franciscan self-understanding through its legislation concerning theological and philosophical education that received papal approval. This will provide initial justification for my contention that there really is a single Franciscan school. The second part will return to Francis, Bonaventure, and Scotus, the three pillars of Franciscan orthodoxy, with the conviction that there really is a historical, canonical school to highlight some key moments and insights in the development of the Franciscan intellectual tradition. But before getting too far, I should clarify what I mean by the words intellectual tradition. While, it is tr while it's true that the Franciscan intellectual tradition is certainly broader than philosophy and theology, boasting major figures in the history of art, engineering, architecture, and the physical sciences and linguistics, I will use the term Franciscan intellectual tradition to, to, re to refer to theology and philosophy. And in the course of this paper, I will also interchangeably use the expression the Franciscan school. So I'm referring to the same thing with both of those terms. Today it is common to think that there is no unified Franciscan school. Many scholars, especially in the wake of the scholastic revival instigated by Leo XIII in his 1879 encyclical, Eterni Patris, have assumed there is no coherent single Franciscan school or intellectual tradition. The differences between Bonaventure and Scotus, when read apart from the Franciscan intellectual tradition, so devastated, along with Thomism, as a result of the French and Italian revolutions and the resulting dissolution of religious houses and the secularization of universities entailing the loss of university chairs served to all but sever the links between Bonaventure and Scotus as they were received, as we'll find, in the history of the Franciscan family. In fighting amongst Franciscans themselves on matters of theology and philosophy, especially between early 20th century German and French speaking friars also emphasized discontinuity. Lost works of Bonaventure only in perhaps untimely 
discovered in the 1870s, coupled with strong papal support of Thomas, as well as Thomistic opposition, in many instances to Duns Scotus, served to emphasize, again, differences between the seraphic and subtle doctors. Uh, one of Bonaventure's titles is the seraphic doctor, and one of Duns Scotus's titles is the subtle doctor, along with the Marian doctor. Such factors, strongly historically conditioned, require a broader look at the entirety of the history of what Franciscan theologians and philosophers actually thought about the identity of the Franciscan school. In the narrative I will develop, Francis, Bonaventure, and John Duns Scotus are the three, quote, pillars of Franciscan orthodoxy. Francis is unique insofar as he is the seraphic father of the Friars Minor, whose unique charism and mission to rebuild Christ's church originates in the singular grace and mandate he received from Christ himself. St. Bonaventure, the seraphic doctor, first transposed St. Francis' life and mission into the words of theology and philosophy. In approaching St. Francis in this way, Bonaventure was in effect treating Francis as a subject for theological reflection. Finally, blessed John Duns Scotus, the subtle and Marian doctor, consummated the insights of Bonaventure by consistently drawing out Bonaventure's philosophical and theological insights concerning the radical implications of divine charity and applying them to the economy of salvation in the form of the absolute primacy of Christ, the immaculate conception, and election in Christ. According to the Franciscan school, in Jesus, Mary, and the church, God reveals his purpose for both nature and grace. Francis, Bonaventure and Scotus teach us that intellectual pursuits, that is, scientia, are for the sake of wisdom, that is, sapientia, which is defined by St. Bonaventure as knowledge passing into the affection or into love. I will argue, then, that a full determination of the uni unity and integrity of a single basic Franciscan intellectual tradition must be rooted in metaphysics and ultimately must be identified and articulated on such a plane. By the term metaphysical, I mean to describe being beyond Aristotle's category of being, and thus a transcendental science leading to knowledge and attributes characteristic of necessary infinite being. Because theology and agreed to and a degree, philosophy as well, however, cannot be pursued in an ahistorical vacuum. We're required to also look at the monuments of the Franciscan tradition in their historical unfolding. We must to borrow from our Lord, search the writings of the order to see if what is being said of the unity of the Franciscan tradition is truly witnessed to, or whether perhaps Bonaventure or Scotus, or both, laid foundations different from those Francis received from Christ. My own conviction of the positive identity and unity of the Franciscan intellectual tradition has been guided under the teaching of an extensive interaction with Father Peter Damien Fellner, a former conventual Franciscan who is now with the Franciscans of the Immaculate. At present, too, too little is known of Fellner's work. This is a shame because Fellner is a living link in a chain of saintly Franciscan scholars which stretches back to Bonaventure and Scotus. Trained in the 1950s at the Pontifical University of St. Bonaventure in Rome, Father Peter benefited from the piety and scholarship of the generation of scholars that followed those had, who had been displaced by the Italian Risorgimento and had made their way to the Seraphicum. These friar theologians and philosophers bequeathed to Father Peter the canonical theological vision of the unity of the school that I shall try to trace in this lecture. There seems to be a bright horizon, however, with respect to a wider dissemination of Father Peter's Bonaventuroscotistic vision. Early last year, Fellner received the John J. Wright Award from the Mariological Society of America for Lifetime Achievements in Mariology. Also, a symposium in his honor was convened this past June at the University of Notre Dame, which will issue an affest shrift. And a collected works project is currently underway, of which I am the editor. The first three volumes will be ready this year. Finally, and it should be noted, a Notre Dame PhD student is currently writing a dissertation under the directorship of Cyril O'Regan that is almost ready on Father Peter's reception of the Second Vatican Council. So now we move into the first part of our talk. Franciscan family resemblance, a comparison and contrast. The Franciscan school in its unity and diversity as an evolving almost organic tradition is analogous to the other better known and more widely accepted theological and philosophical school of St. Thomas Aquinas. A basic difficulty in establishing the unity of the Franciscan intellectual tradition is that Bonaventure and Scotus are not the same person, like St. Thomas is the same person. 
That was a joke. <clears throat> Thomism itself, it should be noted, has been received and organized into various subschools that are sometimes in opposition to one another while remaining in common, a body of disciples of the angelic doctor. Amongst various potential qualifiers that have been domiciled beneath the mantle of the dumb ox, one can mention neo-scholastic Thomism, transcendental Thomism, analytic Thomism, existential Thomism, Laval Thomism, and river forest Thomism, amongst others. These schools form the larger family of Thomism, and each branch has unique insights, points of departure, and modes of inquiry and analysis that distinguishes it from the other varieties of Thomisms. Certain differences, however, between Thomism are so stark that the word Thomism might best be considered as a generic heading with various species and subspecies of Thomism arranged and ordered under it. However, what is common to all forms of Thomism is their general effort to pursue various rational ends while adhering to St. Thomas as guide and master. In comparison with Thomism in general, the Franciscan intellectual tradition admittedly contains tensions. Some Franciscan intellectuals by vocation and religious profession have in the main not been accepted into the broader Franciscan school. William of Ockham comes to mind as the most spectacular and brilliant example. The question remains, however, concerning both the Franciscan school or intellectual tradition and also the criteria for inclusion. I think on this score that the Franciscan school both resembles and recoils from the analogous situation one finds concerning Thomism. On the one hand, like Thomism, adhering to the Franciscan school doesn't require that one be a Franciscan. Many scholars, including myself, I suppose, are broadly Franciscan in this sense, having no affiliation with Franciscanism in a canonical or religious form. However, thinking like and with the great Franciscans marks such a person's intellectual life and work with definite identifiable characteristics. On the other hand, unlike the school of the angelic doctor, the Franciscan intellectual tradition has never required exclusive adherence to a single master um, as perhaps found in the Dominican order in the 14th century. Nor, and this is key, is the tradition ultimately rooted in an academic figure at all. Depending on the time and location, Franciscan authorities have tended to recommend a plurality of intellectual masters, even if St. Bonaventure or Blessed Duns Scotus were privileged or even prescribed. One effect of this approach is that we must take a looser conception of just what makes Franciscan thought Franciscan. Another factor of the Franciscan intellectual traditions not being rooted primarily <clears throat> or focused upon an academic figure, and really not in academia at all, gives it a character that distinguishes it from the mindset of Thomism, even if at the same time making its unity more difficult to perceive or to name. This is especially true for those considering the Franciscan school from a non-historical or non-Franciscan vantage point. However, to borrow a famous concept from Wittgenstein, there is a Franciscan family resemblance, even if particular insights and verbal formulations differ. So now I move to the first main part. I will look at the history of the Franciscan order's canonical legislation with respect to how they viewed their own intellectual, namely philosophical and theological masters. So now I turn to contexts and continuities. I will trace the manner in which the Franciscan intellectual tradition was presented throughout the history of the order and its branches. I will suggest the historical record of the Franciscan tradition runs counter to the current prevailing narrative and perhaps we could call hermeneutic of discontinuity. Then following this, I will briefly look at the early history and founding of the Franciscan school found, focusing upon St. Francis, St. Bonaventure, and Blessed Duns Scotus, the three pillars of Franciscan orthodoxy, highlighting some of the main themes and insights in these philosophers of the, of these founders, excuse me, of the Franciscan school. Uh, tomorrow, hopefully, um, in the next lecture, I will be able to discuss some of the more technical metaphysical questions um, which remain between even Bonaventure and Scotus in greater depth. So, <clears throat> tonight I will just name, briefly name them. So, we move now to an overview of the legislation, historical legislation, that is, regarding Franciscan studies. I will now provide some examples of legislation throughout Franciscan history. For the sake of time and because, there are <clears throat> because of their more explicitly affirmed intellectual outlook, I shall limit examples to three branches of the Franciscan order, the conventual, the observant, and the reformed. <clears throat> 
The record we have shows that the Franciscans have always recognized the unique legacy of having two intellectual giants, namely Bonaventure and Scotus. Um, <clears throat> legislation on Franciscan intellectual life, often with papal appro approval, has emphasized the writings of Bonaventure and Scotus, unlike the Dominican order, which exclusively imposed St. Thomas. In various general chapters of conventual and observant Franciscans throughout the centuries, one discovers general ground rules for, for Franciscan courses of studies. In the earliest extant legislation, Scotus is generally privileged and often required. However, Scotus was to be read alongside other Franciscan masters. Bonaventure is always included, and Alexander of Hales and Richard of Middleton, an early student and successor of Bonaventure, are often mentioned as well. Francis of Meyrones, an early 14th century disciple of Scotus and his successor at Paris is sometimes also included in official lists, rounding out the officially mentioned Franciscan masters to five. Richard and Meyrones are very important and offer genuine advances. However, because Richard and Meyrones were disciples of Bonaventure and Scotus res respectively, it's safe to say that the genius of the Franciscan intellectual tradition is primarily rooted in Bonaventure and Scotus. The earliest record we have of a general chapter commenting on the Franciscan intellectual culture post Bonaventure and Scotus, however, does not name any particular master for the order. It merely instructs students to follow the teaching of their own theological professors. Once masters are named, however, Scotus is favored, <clears throat> although it must be said again, not in an exclusive manner. An example of this approach is the statutes of the 1500 general chapter held in Toledo. We read, quote, the four books of Lombard sentences with questions of the subtle doctor are to be read, or another, for example, Alexander of Hales, Bonaventure, Francis Meyrones, or Richard of Middleton, as is convenient for the students, for not all grasp the subtlety of Scotus." Close quote. Later in the same century, during the pontificates of St. Pius V and Sixtus V, the focus moves to Bonaventure in terms of his unique role and importance in the Franciscan order, as well as in the theological teaching of the church as a whole. In 1568, Pius V approved legislation reforming conventual Franciscan studies, which directed that moral theology be rooted in Bonaventure and dogmatic theology in Scotus. After 1588, and the direct declaration by Sixtus V of Bonaventure as a doctor of the church, Conventual Franciscans infirm that, quote, if explicit or implicit principles and foundations are not present in Scotus, Bonaventure is to be employed, close quote. The very fact that Bonaventure is to be used, so to speak, to fill in the gaps of Scotus implied that Franciscans believed in a fundamental com continuity and harmony between Bonaventure and Scotus, and that the magisterium at that time agreed with this assessment. The Observance General Chapter of 1593 affirms the utility and beauty of Bonaventure in establishing their course of theological study. We read, quote, if in the studies of sacred theology, there would be readings of our truly seraphic saint and fa father, Bonaventure, this would be pious and seems most useful, close quote. And then in the following century, the 1620, in 1620, a uh, conventional Franciscan minister general wrote a book and in this book, we've, he writes, quote, he wrote a book commenting on the legislation and the application of um, studies within the conventual order. And in this book, he writes, quote, in all conventual houses of study, our subtle doctor, that is Scotus, is to be pre preferred and defended, close quote. However, quote, where Scotus omits some necessary matter, the same matter is sought in the books of Alexander of Hales, Bonaventure, and Richard so that the subject matter of theology remains intact in teaching." Close quote. Importantly, on questions of metaphysics, writes the, the Franciscan minister general, quote, teachers in logic, philosophy, and metaphysics shall reject varied and novel's opinion and should be adhering to the teaching of Scotus, Bonaventure, and Alexander as they interpret Aristotle. In this way, students will be prepared for theology. Close quote. Later on in the, in the 17th century, Pope Urban VIII in 1642 approved constitutions of the reform branch of the Friars Minor, which stated that Bonaventure holds the place of honor in the teaching of sacred doctrine, while at the same time, quote, the teaching of Holy Bonaventure is to be harmonized with the teaching of Scotus, close quote. 
close quote. Again, um, what we see here is an emphasis of some sort of fundamental unity in themes and um, an implied metaphysical continuity between Bonaventure and Scotus that is seen both as a development and certainly a change, but also a fundamental harmony or continuity between the two figures. Then in the 18th century, in 1757, <clears throat> the minister general of the Friars Minor enforced the teaching of Scotus and recommended Scotus theologians and philosophers, including the brilliant and prolific Claudius Frossen, who, whom I will mention uh, further below. This decision was personally ratified by Pope Benedict XV in the same century, and this particular statue stood until the late, um, well, the middle of the 19th century, 1858. To these, voices, to these voices, we can add three important popes, Leo XIII, Paul V, and John Paul II. Let's look at the witness of Leo XIII first. In, 15, in 1858, the Congregation for Bishops and Religious Orders approved new directives for theological and philosophical formation of the Friars Minor. In a key passage, we read, quote, authors in theological matters always thrive when their minds are accommodated to the subtle doctor and to holy Bonaventure. <coughs> <clears throat> Pope Leo XIII, justly famous for his 1879 encyclical Aeterni Patris and the resulting Thomistic renewal, approved the 1897, so this is 18 years after the publication of Aeterni Patris, approved in 1897 constitutions of the Friars Minor by stating, quote, in philosophy and theology, the ancients of the Franciscan school are to be given studious adherence, close quote. And this mandate was carried over into the 1922 constitutions of the order. And certainly, the ancient, sc ancient school of the Friars Minor includes um, <clears throat> Bonaventure Scotus. Closer to our own day, and in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI composed an apostolic letter, Alma Parens, in honor of the 700th anniversary of Scotus's birth, wherein he commends Scotus to modern theologians and philosophers, noting how the Second Vatican Council prescribed that philosophical formation be according to the perennial valid patrimony, stating, quote, this perennially valid philosophy certainly includes the Franciscan school, close quote. Pope Paul also goes on to praise Scotus in terms of his perfecting of the Franciscan school, his theodicy or defense of the problem of defense against the problem of evil, and his usefulness for ecumenical dialogue and his faithfulness to the papal magisterium. St. John Paul II continued in this vein. In 1992, he gave a speech in recognition of the liturgical cult of Scotus, wherein he recognized the seraphic love of Scotus is manifest in his doctrines on the absolute primacy of Christ and the Immaculate Conception. And he recommended Scotus, quote, in particular to theologians, priests, pastors of souls, religious, and in a special way to the Franciscans, close quote. quote. Again, in a 2002 address to the Scotistic Commission, Pope John Paul II repeated Paul VI by praising Scotus as, quote, the perfecter of Bonaventure and as, quote, the most distinguished representative of the Franciscan school. In sum, we find that papally approved Franciscan law has always affirmed the importance of the Franciscan intellectual tradition as well as its integrity on some level as a school of theology and philosophy, a school to be respected, taught, developed, and approved. We may also conclude that Scotus in the main is consistently privileged in the various branches of the Franciscan family. However, St. Bonaventure was always seen as integral, even foundational to the Franciscan school. Most interestingly, whereas Bonaventure was declared by Sixtus V a doctor of the church, in some ways equal in authority to St. Thomas, Scotus was nevertheless viewed within his own order as the leader of the Franciscan school. Although this may seem odd to some, from the vantage point of the broader context surrounding the narrative just presented, this perhaps makes better sense. At the heart of the legislation and papal approbation I've just discussed, is concerned, this, this approbation is concerned to preserve St. Francis's pursuit of gospel perfection within academics. Franciscans always viewed intellectual pursuits as having a practical end. This end was the love of God. Knowledge, though a good in itself, pertaining to the good of intellect was always for the sake of requiring wisdom. Wisdom, however, in this sense was only possible through grace and personal union in the Holy Spirit to the Trinity. Taking as they did St. Francis as their primary point of departure, a true locus theologicus, 
Authentic Franciscan thought always sought to dispose the person to grace and the gift of the spirit, and once in grace, to deepen faith in love so that by better knowing God, persons could be disposed to, accept it into the, to be accepted into the blessed company of Christ, Mary, and the saints. Practically speaking, like every other Franciscan pursuit, theology was, in, was to aid the student in imitating St. Francis's radical commitment to the gospel through the mediation of Mary and bringing forth Christ in each friar as well as those souls under the friar's care. Scotus was privileged and even prescribed in the order, not as an alternative to Bonaventure or even Francis, I would argue. Rather, continuity with the seraphic father and doctor was always presumed. Scotus, I would suggest, was so strongly defended and promoted within the order because of his defense and radical commitment to twin hallmark doctrines of the Franciscan order concerning the economy of salvation, the primacy of Christ and the immaculate conception. As Pius IX in 1854 will explain, in some way, according to the mind of Scotus, Mary and Jesus and Mary were predestined in one and the same dec decree. It was these two contested doctrines that the Franciscan order was committed to upholding and which had staggering ramifications for God's concrete intentions in the created order, touching upon theology and metaphysics and accenting de facto the mystery of creation as bound up in Christ and Mary over an analysis of nature and physical causes abstractly considered. Lastly, we should see that Scotus, going beyond Bonaventure, most clearly and consistently applied the insights of St. Francis into the diffusive good of the Father, the primacy of Christ as the head of all creation, as well as the unique relationship between the Spirit and the Virgin. So now that we've offered some a history of Franciscan legislation implying the Franciscan under, self-understanding of the relationship between Bonaventure and Scotus and both of those theological figures with respect back to St. Francis himself, I will provide kind of a laundry list of names of Franciscan intellectuals, namely theologians and philosophers, who tried to carry out and manifest this legislation in their own writing. <clears throat> So, in order to show that the legal stamp of approval on the Franciscan intellectual tradition I've just outlined is not just a vision in theory, but was a real, living, practical reality, I've selected several Franciscan thinkers who lived out this legal picture. The following list certainly does not exhaust the names that could be included. Inasmuch, however, as those included stretch across the centuries and hail from most, if not all, the major branches of the Franciscan family at that time, I hope it will be representative. So in the first place, we can mention Blessed John Dun Scotus. As a successor in some ways to St. Bonaventure himself, um, Scotus lived from 1266 to 1387. Scotus emphasized the primacy of charity, carrying out his insights into the primacy of charity into the realms of Trinitarian theology, affecting his understanding of the relation of origins and the constitutions of persons in the, in the Godhead, also with respect to anthropology, and especially with respect to metaphysical language, such as the disjunctive transcendentals, um, the notion of pure perfections, um, and then finally, and very importantly, the univocal concept of being. Another figure who is very important in integrating and continuing this process of harmonization, but not a process of necessarily explicitly always attempting to harmonize, but with a common, but a theologian who operated within a common set of theological assumptions, especially theological themes, was Francis Meirones, who was Scotus' student, whom I mentioned earlier, and he lived from 1280 to 1328. Like Scotus, he was given to abstraction and very subtle metaphysical and philosophical questions. He was called by some the Doctor Illuminatus, or the Magister Abstractionis. However, with Meirones, we find, in some sense, a re, an intentional reintegration of Bonaventurian concerns and themes in Meirones' use of the Pseudo Dionysius and the, an emphasis on apophatic theology alongside the theology um, of negating with respect to God rather than just positively saying. So if we say, God is good, that's a cataphatic way of saying something about God that we can know. But we can also say God is not good in the sense that I'm good in myself. 
So where SCOTUS was given more to um, a cataphatic approach, affirming things of God, Francis Mayrones, one of SCOTUS's most famous and faithful students, also brought in this cataphatic notion, which is very um, prevalent in St. Bonaventure, who in um, the final part of his own work on, on the spiritual life called the Trip Away, he <clears throat> emphasizes and privileges the Dionysian way, the via negativa, the apophatic way, saying God is not good like a creature is good, over the Augustinian way that Bonaventure takes it, as Bonaventure takes it, of saying that God is good. Um, so Meirones is an important person who reintegrates certain Bonaventurian themes and concerns. Another figure is a figure you've likely all heard of, uh, St. Bernardine of the Siena, the great 14th century preacher. Bernardine of Siena was known for his dogged defense of the primacy of Christ and the Immaculate Conception. So he's very scotistic on this point. However, he also carried along and modeled his theology on Bonaventure's Breviloquium. So on the one hand, he's defending scotistic themes while preaching on the basis of Bonaventure's Summa of Theology, his brief word about theology. <clears throat> St. Lawrence of Brindisi, a Capuchin, saint and doctor of the church, who, who died in the early 17th century, was also uh, a brilliant follower of both Bonaventure and Scotus. Matthias Hauser is an interesting figure and little known. Um, he lived in the 1650s. He was a Flemish Franciscan author who actually composed a compendium of theology entitled, A Compendium of the Whole Theology from Our Masters, Alexander of Hales, St. Bonaventure, and Duns Scotus. In this sense, he's trying to take the Franciscan legislation up to that point very seriously and put together a compendium of the theological um, writings of all three of these masters. <clears throat> Claudius Frossen, whom I mentioned earlier, recommended, um, <clears throat> he was a Franciscan observant who died in the year 1711. He, wrote a, he was a brilliant scholar, wrote biblical commentaries, wrote, wrote commentaries on an, almost the entirety of scripture. He was also a brilliant philosopher, wrote philosophical texts, and he also wrote a monumental 12-volume work called Scotus Academicus, which is a massive you know, neo-scholastic manual or high scholastic manual of uh, Franciscan theology according to the mind of Scotus. What's interesting in Frossen is that when Scotus doesn't treat of a topic explicitly, he will immediately recur to what St. Bonaventure says, as though, they, as though he's assuming they fit almost seamlessly together. And so he appeals equally, even though Scotus is privileged, to St. Bonaventure in terms of this process of harmonization that seems to be spoken of in the Franciscan legislation itself. So you've, you've moved from the 13th century up to now the 18th century. Another figure, a 19th century writer, uh, Gabriel Casanova, wrote a book called A Course of Philosophy and Theology According to the Mind of Scotus and Bonaventure. Again, emphasizing this, this fundamental continuity even in the presence of discontinuities and differences. The point is, is they, there, was a, there was a common opinion that there is such a thing as a Franciscan intellectual tradition or school. We can name figures like St. Maximian Kolbe, who, whom we've all heard of, the martyr of charity. He was one who emphasized Franciscan themes and metaphysics, especially with respect to <clears throat> the perfections of God as given over or engraced in the perfections of Our Lady, while at the same time emphasizing Bonaventurian themes about the relationship between um, Our Lady and the Holy Spirit as created and un uncreated Immaculate Conception, even though Bonaventure didn't use that term. There are hints in Bonaventure that Maxim Maximilian, St. Maximilian builds upon. <clears throat> there are several other authors through the 20th century making this same point um, up to the present day. Father Peter Damien Fellner, who has written extensively in theology and philosophy without making Bonaventure and Scotus identical, because cert certainly they're not. He tries to read them in a fundamental continuity along the mind of the canonical historical legislative uh, history that I've tried to provide. So I realize at this point that so many names and so many um, facts and figures could be a little bit overwhelming. It's OK if one doesn't remember all of these terms. The point is, is I'm trying to paint a general picture, a general narrative of how Franciscans understood themselves in their own intellectual tradition and thereby formation, and then how these were carried out, this, this vision was carried out in various Franciscan authors throughout the centuries, especially prior to the 20th century. <clears throat>
Now we move to the, the second and final part of my talk. The witnesses of tradition, the foundations and founders, arguably, of the Franciscan order. St. Francis and early Francis, Franciscan academics. As we consider the place of St. Francis himself as the founder and exemplar of what I argue is the Franciscan intellectual tradition, again, the common opinion that he placed little value of serious academics, little value upon serious academic study of theology, we might consider as our starting point a verse very important to St. Francis himself. John, 1 John 4.16, God is love, and he that abides in love abides in God and God in him. Rooted in poverty and the radical pursuit of God, Francis never viewed his life of seeking evangelical perfection and devotion to the mother of God as strictly opposed to intellectual pursuits. Francis, writing to St. Anthony of Padua, a master of theology himself, writes, quote, I am pleased that you teach sacred theology to the brothers, providing that you do not ext extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion during this kind of study, close quote. And by the 1230s, just four years after St. Francis' death, Franciscans were already studying at the universities of Paris and Oxford with some of the greatest Franciscan ma masters. Having arrived in England only five years earlier, in 1229, the Franciscans came under the tutelage of the great polymath and future Bishop of Lincoln, Robert Grosteste. Though not a Franciscan himself, Grosteste served as a teacher, protector, and patron of the Franciscans at Oxford. Under his care, writes the Franciscan chronicler Thomas of Eccleston, quote, the friars within a short time made incalculable progress, both in scholastic disputations and in the subtle morality suitable for preaching, close quote. And at Oxford, Following the example and emphases of Gross Test, the friars tended to focus more upon the study and interpretation of, in the words of Gross Test, quote, the irrefragable authority of scripture, which was colored oftentimes by a preference for positive sciences like language, translation, and the like. Among the most notable of these early Franciscan scholars are Adam Marsh, uh, Thomas of York, uh, even Richard Rufus, and then later um, Roger Bacon. Moving to Paris and the other important university, um, and again, just to be just to be clear, o Oxford and Paris. Well, Oxford was like Oxford of today back then. Um, perhaps not quite as good because it was second place to Paris. So Paris was like the Oxford of today. So these are the two most important intellectual centers of the medieval world. So by very early on in the Franciscan history, history only four years after the death of Saint Francis. Franciscans are already studying theology. So the question is, okay, how do we move into this intellectual world without violating or running contrary to our own commitment to evangelical perfection and poverty? I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And it's never been entirely resolved, but there is a response. So moving to Paris then. At Paris, academic interests within the order greatly benefited when the English-born Parisian master of theology, Alexander of Hales, took the Franciscan habit in 1236. This is because Alexander held a university chair at Paris prior to his entry into the Franciscan order. And the title and possession of the chair was attached to the person occupying it. Thus, when Alexander became a Franciscan, a Franciscan became a major university figure at the most important intellectual center in Western Christendom. While Gross Test and the Oxford Friars emphasized study of scripture, the positive sciences, and acquisition of languages, Alexander of Hales is doubly notable as the first university master to systematically incorporate Aristotle into dogmatic theology, as well as around 1215, many years prior to his becoming a friar, influencing the practice at Paris of using Peter Lombard's sentences, in addition to scripture, as the main theology textbook. Hale sought to resolve at the speculative, speculative level the mind of the church fathers with Aristotle. The Oxford man, Roger Bacon, in the middle of the 13th century, in virtue of this move towards the sentence commentaries and speculative thought, will complain bitterly about Aristotle and Lombard subverting the primacy of scripture. But just a generation later, however, John Duns Scotus initially trained at Oxford in the Grosstestian tradition and strongly influenced by Gross test himself, 
came to be viewed as one of the greatest speculative minds humanity has yet produced, an interesting transposition of Oxford and Paris. Now we move to St. Bonaventure. Emblematic in a sense of St. Bonaventure's entire outlook is, can be summed up in the statement, Christ is our metaphysics, and Christ holds the center in all things, including all the sciences. And thus, in virtue of his unique centrality, he is our one teacher, the title of a famous sermon of St. Bonaventure. St. Bonaventure arguably first clarifies the relationship between the Franciscan vocation and the intellectual life. I don't mean to imply that St. Anthony, Alexander's and others, Alexander and others were not Franciscan. Rather, these figures received their intellectual formation prior to their becoming Franciscan. And as far as I can tell, Bonaventure was the first to attempt to transpose the life of St. Francis into a philosophical theological vision that both allowed for while at the same time explaining the possibility of the realization of Francis's evangelical perfection as an academic. Born in 1221 and reposing in 1274, Bonaventure is a key figure in summing up the previous work <clears throat> and in bringing it to a new level. With a devotion to Francis from childhood, Bonaventure arrived in Paris at the university around 1235. He didn't immediately enter the order, but instead studied the liberal arts as a secular student. And in 1243, after already becoming a master of arts, Bonaventure became a friar. And then by 1254, 12 years later, St. Bonaventure completed his theological studies and began his tenure as a Franciscan master of theology. And in the same year, 1254, Bonaventure composed his famous Retracing of the Arts to Theology, which is an analysis of the purpose and goal of all academic studies and their summation or ordering to theology. During his time as professor from 1254 to 1257, Bonaventure also composed his disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ, on the mystery of the Trinity, as well as the sermon, Christ the One Teacher of All, as, and finally his Summa, but not limited to these texts. These are just some of the very key ones, which is called his summa, which is called the Breviloquium. In these works, Bonaventure weaves together the fruits of his education and formation into a theological vision. These mediate, these writings mediate between his <clears throat> early theological and philosophical works and his later writings of specifically Franciscan intellectual, um, Franciscan genius, namely uh, the journey of the mind into God. Um, a very important text. Also, the two lives of St. Francis, the Legenda Maior and the Legenda Minor, as well as his final uncompleted masterpiece, the Collations on the Six Days of Creation. Strangely, three works were lost from this magisterial period from 1254 to 1257. The disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ, the disputed questions on the Trinity, and thirdly, again, not exclusively, um, a very important sermon, the ser his sermon on Christ, the one teacher of all. These were lost and forgotten for over 500 years and were last mentioned only by the great fr Franciscan scholar, Peter John Olivi, who died in 19, I mean, 1298. And it should be noted here that Peter John of Olivi is a key link um, mediating ideas of Bonaventure through to the time of Scotus. So he's, Olivi is a key intermediary figure here and a very important thinker in his own right. <clears throat> the two disputations I've just mentioned were only rediscovered in the 1870s by the Franciscan father, Fidelis Afana, the first editor of the only extant edition of St. Bonaventure's works that approaches a critical edition. The rediscovery of the disputed question certainly helped to provide a fuller picture of the technical aspects of St. Bonaventure's thoughts. These texts are crucial because Bonaventure's disputed questions provide some of his most important ideas in his theological and philosophical vision. In this sense, they are fruits of Bonaventure's earlier work, summing up and crystallizing its key developments. A, cri a critical point of focus in these texts is their common focus upon the manner in which philosophical and theological trends, especially related to the writings of Aristotle, bore upon the two foundational mysteries of the Christian faith, the Trinity and the Incarnation. Situated within a broader analysis of <clears throat> how to think about God in himself and as creator and savior, Bonaventure was addressing questions pertaining to the interface between faith and reason, 
philosophy and theology, intellect and will, science and wisdom, and ultimately nature and person. His insights in these texts became, so to speak, um, canonical as mediated through figures like Olivi and represented uh, in his later collations, especially on the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, as well as his collations on the six days of creation, later works. The Holy Spirit was composed 1267, 1268, and the collations were, were composed from about 1272, 73 to 74, the year St. Bonaventure died. By 1257, however, Bonaventure's talents were needed elsewhere. And he was elected as the seventh minister general, that is, the leader of all the Franciscans worldwide of the Franciscan order. This would greatly curtail his scholastic writings. However, in the context of addressing the needs of the worldwide Franciscan order, we discover more fully Bonaventure's formative attachment and devotion to Francis and, the way, and his way of life. And it is in this context Bonaventure's devotion to Francis more so than strictly academic methods, texts, and concerns, crystallizes Bonaventure's spiritual imagination and shapes his theological and philosophical outlook and output. Indeed, uh, Bonaventure wrote one of the best biographies of St. Francis, <clears throat> his childhood life and patron saint. Several times during his tenure as a university professor, Bonaventure wrote of the debt of devotion he had to Francis. These instances do demonstrate the conscious intention of Bonaventure to conform every area of his life to Francis's gospel ideal. Bonaventure's most explicit statement about Francis, however, comes post-1257 in the prologue to his Legenda Maior. This was written in 1263. In the prologue, Bonaventure writes, quote, I would never have attempted writing the life of Francis if the fervent desire of the brothers had not aroused me and the devotion which I am obliged to have toward our Holy Father had not compelled me. For when I was a boy, as I vividly remember, I was snatched from the jaws of death by his invocation and merits. So if I remained silent and did not sing his praises, I fear that I would be rightly accused of the crime of ingratitude." Close quote. These comments show that Bonaventure, from a young age, was devoted both to Francis and his mendicant life of gospel perfection. Bonaventure sought to live out Francis' vision and integrate it into the intellectual life of the order through the emphasis on, his, on the necessity for sanctification of the intellect. In an autobiographical pa passage of a letter from the 1250s, 1254, Bonaventure writes, quote, for I confess before God that what made me love St. Francis' way of life so much was that <clears throat> it is exactly like the origin and perfection of the church itself which began first with simple fishermen and afterwards developed to include the most illustrious and learned doctors. You find the same thing in the order of St. Francis. In this way, God reveals that it did not come th about through human calculations, but through Christ." Close quote. In summing up this section on St. Bonaventure, we can conclude that Bonaventure is the central figure in the Franciscan school because it was he who first employed philosophy to the end of uniting reason and faith, because it was he who first employed and that is, excuse me, uniting reason and faith, knowledge and charity into a complete theological vision in explicit continuity with the life and teachings of St. Francis. Bonaventure framed the central tenets of Christian revelation in a uniquely Franciscan manner, emphasizing the primacy of charity in the Trinity and the anthropological metaphor. That means reasoning from human psychology and uh, philosophical power such as memory, intellection, and volition to then speak about God and his inner life, namely having the powers of memory, intellection, and volition, and thus being able to speak more clearly about the generation procession of the persons of the Trinity. So this, that's what I mean by anthropological metaphor. <clears throat> uh, so using the anthropological metaphor as, of the human soul as the image of God, Bonaventure was able to understand the unique centrality of Jesus Christ hypostatically as the middle person of the Trinity, as assuming a middle nature composed of matter and spirit, as well as mediating between God and man as redeemer and savior. So in his divinity, he's the middle person of the Trinity between the Father and the Spirit, mediating. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the assumption, he assumes the middle nature of creation, man composed of matter and spirit, uniting those two extreme um, principles of activity and kinds of realities. And then also, finally, as savior and redeemer, mediating in the order of grace 
between God and man. So Christ has this radical centrality in Bonaventure's entire theological and philosophical outlook. Bonaventure, as mentioned above, writes that Christ is his metaphysics. His logic of emanation, exemplification, and consummation, that means the outflowing, the, the representing, and terminating in creation. So God creates something. Creation terminates in kinds of things which exemplify God's creative intentions. And then these things are intended to return to God through consummation. That's um, <clears throat> emanation, exemplification, and consummation. This reality in creation, this order of procession and return in creation, models the Trinity. And, and models within the creation the origin, generation, and procession of the persons of the Trinity. And this allowed Bonaventure to articulate a theological metaphysic that recognizes not only nature's and physical causality, but also the symbolic or quasi-sacramentality of creation as both terms and signs of God's creative freedom. That means both in terms of a created thing's intelligibility, the formal intellectual content, as well as its purpose. Where does this fit in the schema of creation in relation to Christ and what God purposed in Christ? <clears throat> the human being, as the image of God, is both the pinnacle of God's creation as well as the clearest sign for Bonaventure of the divine power and unity. Bonaventure's effort of faith-seeking understanding of the mysteries of the Trinity, the incarnation of Christ, the divine maternity in the church, and as well the church, allowed him to develop philosophical concepts and language that would become defining characteristics in the thought of John Duns Scotus. In a process of borrowing and innovation, Bonaventure used the notions of, now I just note these, and this will be discussed hopefully more in depth tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> so I don't expect you to understand exactly what I'm referring to, but they become important intellectual philosophical concepts and instruments, so to speak, in the Franciscan metaphysical um, outlook and explanation. So in, in a process of borrowing and innovation, Bonaventure used the notions of the disjunctive transcendental, the pure perfection, an early form of the formal distinction, and implicitly, a univocal concept of being. These insights arose through Bonaventure's contemplation of the revelation of Christ and his mediation, the divine maternity of Mary, human freedom, and the perfection of the divine being. Bonaventure's thought was rooted in faith for the perfection of charity, as he puts it in his first book on the sentences, Ut Boni Fiamis, that is, theology is always so that we can be good, for the sake of becoming good. Moving on now to John Duns Scotus. Building upon Bonaventure, who could say that Christ is our metaphysics and that Christ is the one teacher, Scotus can write that Paul is the Christian philosopher who expounds the cosmic implications of Christ and the woman of the covenant and the medical, metaphysical um, vision guiding salvation history. Scotus, uh, who lived from 1266 1267 to 1308, is after Bonaventure the greatest theological and philosophical mind of the Franciscan order. Now I mean that canonically in terms of Franciscan self-understanding and in terms of the Franciscan school's own uh, legislation about um, theological teaching. Of course, one can argue that Occam was perhaps the most brilliant mind, but I don't think he received the kind of acceptance within the Franciscan tradition that Bonaventure and Scotus do. Alevi was another brilliant figure. Um, <clears throat> So with that qualification in mind. So if Bonaventure is pivot and foundation of the Franciscan school, rendering Francis into an academic theological key while both inaugurating and mediating a specifically Franciscan vision of the world, Scotus is according to Paul VI and John Paul II, the perfecter of Bonaventure. As I see it, Scotus and Francis too are intimately united for it seems that <clears throat> St. Francis, according to the words of Paul, Pope Paul VI, Scotus's works embody uh, St. Francis of Assisi's most beautiful ideal of perfection. And the ardor of the seraphic spirit is embedded in the work of Scotus and inflames it, according to Paul VI. Scotus developed Bonaventurian themes, especially pertaining, pertaining to Trinitarian theology, creation, and anthropology. 
his insights into the origins and relations of the divine person, the infinity, simplicity, unity, and primacy of the divine being, and his prioritizing of charity and freedom as a legacy of Francis and Bonaventure, brought by Scotus into an incredibly intricate and subtle synthesis. Central, however, are his insights into the implications of the place that charity holds in the economy of salvation. Direct and clear knowledge of God's infinite being, according to Scotus, cannot be attained by finite minds through their own impetus or powers. Because God is both simple and infinite, anything predicated of God, however, as an essential perfection of the divine nature will be in reality or in being identical with God. And because God is most perfect, he is personal with volition and freedom as essential attributes. If, however, the divine through itself cannot be ac accessed by finite minds, constraints are placed, both generically and specifically, upon the formulation and re resolution of metaphysical and theological questions. Generally, God's divinity, power, and eternity are manifest in creation as creation's source and origin. <clears throat> The specific intentions of God are manifest in how he is actually willed to order creation. This is where the Bonaventuro scotistic use of univocal concepts, disjunctive transcendentals, pure perfections, and the formal distinction arise. How do we talk about God on the basis of realities that are not God? Time doesn't allow now for discussion at length of these matters, but hopefully tomorrow again I'll be able to address some of these things at greater length. The basic upshot, though, of Scotus's insights into the epistemic, epistemic constraints placed upon finite minds, because they are finite, is important for Scotus's development of Bonaventure's theological metaphysics, affirming the primacy of charity in God, and thus freedom and personhood without opposition or separation arising between God's nature and his tri-person being. Whereas Bonaventure clearly articulated a metaphysics of perfect being that acts in and through his infinite free charity, Bonaventure also seemingly at times failed to consistently apply this position to the economy of salvation. Scotus recognized this and sought to, in a manner of speaking, dot the I's and cross the T's of Bonaventure's metaphysics on this point. Based upon God's infinite goodness, Scotus inferred that what is best in end is first an intention for a most perfect willer. In the advent of Christ, a divine person assuming a human nature, perfect in the order of both nature and grace, so Scotus reasons, is the best thing God did and in fact could have done. Because the incarnation is the best, it is the most lovable. It's the most lovable object and brings the greatest glory to God the Father. Thus, Christ was first in the divine intention and thereby orders creation in this primacy in his divinity absolutely, and as a man, as perfect union, and a divine person. Going further, Scotus reasons, if Christ is ontologically a mediator, in fact the perfect mediator, his mediation will be realized in some created person, namely, namely Mary. The perfection of Christ's mediation serves as the metaphysical basis for the Immaculate Conception. Mary is most perfectly saved because most perfectly redeemed, that is, she's redeemed preventatively from ever incurring or under, under <clears throat> falling under uh, the curse of original sin. And this is opposed to a second best way of being liberated from sin, having once been implicated in it. Later, Scotus will deepen, Scotus will deepen this insight by seeing Mary not only as most perfectly redeemed in terms of her non-implication and non-participation in Adam's sin, but also in the perfection of her person in grace. So there's a negative aspect. She's free from any kind of sin, but there's a positive aspect. She's filled with all the grace of the Holy Spirit that Christ is, can possibly mediate. So Mary is both recipient of Christ's redemption and also uniquely able to cooperate in Christ's mission because she's pre-redeemed. She's preservatively redeemed. So she's able to uniquely co cooperate in Christ's mission as well as the mission of the Spirit sent by Christ. And this will become the basis for St. Maximilian Kolbe's insights into the Immaculate Conception and his understanding of Mary and consecration. Working backwards then, 
We can recognize in SCOTUS use of the univocal concept of being, both a metaphysical, both a metaphysical instrument, that means a concept to talk about something, used to explain <clears throat> the essentially analogical relation of God and creation, as well as a foreshadowing of the hypostatic union, one person in two natures, and one concept that can be realized in two different modes, finite and infinite. Univocity, in this case, is a, a logical tool that does not collapse God and creation by subsuming them under a common category or genus. Rather, it is for Scotus and, a, and the Franciscans ultimately a way to speak about analogy centered upon and fully realized in the concrete analogy of divinity and humanity in the one Christ. So according to Bonaventure, perfect charity is realized in perfect personal act. And this is the formal motive of all divine action, charity, charity. Um, <clears throat> going further, Francis understands the incarnation, the highest work of God, as the movement of the Father towards creation in order to bring creation into personal communion with himself through Jesus Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Love itself, again, is the, is the motive and thus the intrinsic justification for creation. Bonaventure bases himself on this same foundation and provides rigorous analyses of divine person and freedom that re renders this belief in the primacy of charity coherent. However, Francis had already gone further in applying the primacy of charity to, to God's activity ad extra. So we're distinguishing here between charity and, and <clears throat> God's goodness as being imminent within the, within the Trinity, the love of the Trinity in itself, and the love of the Trinity as expressed and communicated and realized in creation. So ad intra, in God, ad extra, outside of God, namely in creation. So Bonaventure, though admitting the possibility of the incarnation apart from sin and the need for redemption, he in the end linked the motive of the incarnation essentially to the need of redemption thus subordinating the incarnation to the occasion of Christ's sin. Now with Bonaventure, there's an interesting distinction. Um, <clears throat> he says in the first place, the, the reason for causing the action to be what he calls the, calls the, the ratio educens, the, the, the reason that brings it forth or leads it forth is sin and the need for redemption. The incarnation is on account of sin and the need for redemption. But he says the ratio finalis of creation is the intrinsic perfection of the incarnation itself. And so, you know, speaking in terms of final causality, a final, cause, final causality situates the other causes and orders them purposively. You might even make an argument that Bonaventure, in affirming that Christ himself is the final cause of creation or the ultimate reason for creation, Bonaventure is moving towards a notion that Scotus will clearly articulate in terms of the absolute primacy of Christ. Christ came always to perfect creation not as an intrinsic or necessary outworking of creation, but as a freely given perfection and supernaturalizing of creation in and through Christ. So Christ was always came for resurrected life and ascended life in heaven. In the occasion of sin, Christ also came in the mode of redeemer. But the primacy is Christ's own goodness. This is what God always intended. So this situates and colors how one looks at the entire created order and then frames and responds to metaphysical questions relating to this de facto situation that God has established, pres presuming the primacy of Christ. So if Bonaventure in the end seems to subordinate salvation to the need of redemption from sin, Francis intuiting the more radical implications of the absolute primacy of charity, actually distinguish salvation as life and grace from redemption, as the need to be cleansed of sin and move from a state of non-communion with God into communion or covenant with God. And Francis actually subordinated redemption to salvation. So redemption is for the sake of salvation, and salvation is for the sake of the glorification of God in Christ. Christ just, the goodness of Christ justifies itself as the ultimate reason for creation. So <clears throat> on this basis of the primacy of, of charity and goodness in God, Francis de facto applying this primacy of charity in God to creation affirmed the thesis that the incarnation was well, in a sense prior to and independently of God's foreknowledge of sin and need for redemption. This theory was most skillfully explained and defended by Scotus. However, 
the roots of this theory of the Franciscan thesis of the absolute primacy of Jesus and Mary by implication, because Mary is always co-predestined to be his mother, um, the roots go back to St. Francis himself. The tree reached a certain maturity, if not full flowering in St. Bonaventure. And this is where I think Paul VI is calling Bonaventure, Scotus the perfecter of Bonaventure, because Bonaventure is drawing out these implications. I mean, Scotus is drawing out these implications found in Bonaventure of this radical primacy of charity in God, and then applying it consistently on the same kind of logical basis to creation, and seeing in Christ this radical perfection of creation and the realization of charity. <clears throat> So conclusion, returning to Yeats, remember Yeats said the center cannot hold, but we say with the Franciscans, the center must hold because the center is Christ. No beast slouches towards Bethlehem. In, in filling the manger, Christ filled creation with the grace of the firstborn. And as the first fruits of the resurrection, Christ reigns in the new Jerusalem. In the words of St. Bonaventure, the works of Christ do not fail or go backwards. They rather increase in progress. In the Franciscan intellectual tradition, the center holds because the center is Christ, the medium or center of all science and wisdom. For Francis and his academic disciples, theology and metaphysics is always situated within the one Christic and Marian economy of salvation. Scotus clarifies the implication of this for metaphysical theology nested in salvation history. Christ and Mary were always the Father's first love, and we were elected in and created for them. God in his goodness always willed to unite himself in crea to creation. In the event of sin, Christ's salvation moved through redemption and showed forth the wisdom of the child born of Mary in Bethlehem through the foolishness of the cross. When he was lifted up, Jesus drew all men to himself, the mystery of Trinitarian communion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.